Welcome to the Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. As most weeks, you're with Mike and Ian. And we are rereading the Aubrey Matron books of Patrick O'Brien, as well as exploring the Aubrey Matron world. Ian, what, what did we do last week and what are we up to this week? Goodness me, it checks notes in a hurry. So the last week, Mike, we finished up The Commodore. We wrapped up with uh, Bologna and the Stately defeating the French off of Ireland, uh, with Stephen finding Diana <gasps> living with a relative nearby, and we learned of the death of Jack and Stephen's nemesis, the Duke of Habakstal. Diana took Stephen to her bed and asked him never to go to sea again. Now, Mike, before we turn the pages and reach for the Yellow Admiral, this week we're going to pause and devote the entire episode to the interview that we had recently with Will Soffrin and Richard Bailey. Well, Will's book, you know, it's, it's ideal timing. The, the book All Hands on Deck, A Modern Day High Seas Adventure to the Far Side of the World, is just out. And it tells the story of the voyage of the HMS Rose from Connecticut to California, attempting to get there in time for the filming of the Peter Weir movie, Master and Commander. Ah, oh, fan favorite. Um, we took the time to talk to Will and to Captain Richard Bailey of the Rose, also known as Master and Commander's HMS Surprise, about their remarkable adventure and to learn a little bit more about the story behind the book. Let's take a listen. We're really excited to be able to host this conversation between me and Mike and Will Soffron and Captain Richard Bailey. Will, on the one hand, being a, a one-time boat builder and yacht racer and now author. And Richard, Captain Bailey, veteran skipper, operator and restorer of tall ships. Will, you're the author of a book that's just out entitled All Hands on Deck, and I love the subtitle here, A Modern Day High Seas Adventure to the Far Side of the World. And there are some important clues in that subtitle that we'll get to shortly. Um, to set the scene for the book, we can't do any better, I don't think, than quote from the publisher's blurb. So here we go. In the late 1990s, Patrick O'Brien's beloved massively best-selling historical novel series was destined for film with Master and Commander The Far Side of the World. With director Peter Weir and stars Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany signed on, there was only one problem. The Rose, the replica 18th century warship that filmmakers had bought for the production, was in Newport, Rhode Island, two oceans and thousands of miles away from Hollywood. Enter a ragtag crew of 30 oddballs and tall ship fanatics, one of whom I think is you, Will, uh, and the captain of whom is Richard, who's with us today. And together, the crew embarked on an epic adventure, racing a ticking clock, fighting against Mother Nature and occasionally each other to deliver the rose, hopefully in one piece. So with that setup, I can only say welcome, Will and Richard. It's great to have you with us on the show. Thanks for having us, Ian and Mike. It's awesome to be here. Indeed. So... Will, can you take us back to the 1990s for a minute? You got asked to work on a ship that was headed in some haste to a filming location for a Patrick O'Brien movie. What did you know about Patrick O'Brien as an author at that point? And what part did the books play in your decision to set out on this voyage? So let me start off with the, the beginning of that. After high school, I enrolled in a wooden boat restoration apprenticeship program in Newport, Rhode Island at the school. Uh, at the time, it was called the International Yacht Restoration School. And today, it's known as uh, the Iris School of Technology and Trade. And I did the program for two years, completing it in 2001. And my first job was to uh, help the complete the restoration of uh, America's oldest 12-meter yacht, Onawa, and wow. then crew her over in Europe for the America's Cup Jubilee and the Prada Classic Yacht Challenge in the Mediterranean. And the captain of Onawa, a man named Casey Fashano, had a, a, a big tall ship background and had been the maid on Rose in 96 for her transatlantic passage. Uh. Um, and Casey um, reminded me regularly how easy I had it on yachts. Um, <laughs> and though I worked very hard for him, <clears throat> he passed on a lot of what he learned through tall ships. So after uh, the tour had ended in Europe, returned back to America in late fall and <clears throat> I don't have any job opportunities. 
And one day Casey uh, tells me that I'm going to go down to the tall ship Rose and do some work. And I knew that there wasn't an, there wasn't an opportunity for question. It's what I needed to go do. So uh, begrudgingly, I went down to Rose probably with a biased opinion because of the taunting I had received over the last (laughs) nine months about how easy I had it on yachts. So I was probably just a little bit more scared than anything else about what, Uh what I was going to be stepping into. And, you know, I get on the ship and there's the chief mate, Tony Arrow. Tony um, right away brought me down into the ship and took me into this tiny little compartment where you couldn't even stand up and showed me a water maker and asked me if I could rebuild it. And I, I mean, I'd heard of them, but I'd never seen them. And I told them that I could take it apart, but wasn't really so sure about how well I could put it back together. <laughs> Surprisingly, uh, he gave me the spiel about how Rose had just been acquired by 20th Century Fox. And did I want to sail to California to make a movie? Wow. Um, at the time, I'd heard of Patrick O'Brien, but in mm-hmm. all honesty, I, I'd not read any of his books. And so after leaving the ship, I walked to a bookstore and had a friend working there who uh, I just told him about this opportunity about getting paid to sail to California and, and make a movie. And uh, he handed me a copy of Master and Commander and said it was on him and told me to uh, suggest that I go start reading it. Or no, it was uh, HMS Surprise. Sorry. Because he, he, he wanted me to jump into the ship and, and get to know, understand why Rose was, uh, was picked for the, for the gig. Fantastic. So th- that's the the starting point for you, Will. That's that's certainly not the starting point for the Rose. Um, Richard, could t- tell us about where you and the Rose were at in the 1990s, and what kind of ship had she been up to then, and what tell us about your connection with her. Well, there are many chapters to Rose's life, and I don't think we have time to tell them all. So let's okay. just start with uh, in 1990-ish. Rose became Coast Guard inspected as a sailing school vessel. This was kind of a new class of vessel that had Congress had directed the Coast Guard to create, and the regulations came down in 1996. No, I'm sorry, 1986. So uh, the then owners of Rose uh, had her as a dockside attraction, and they they hired me and. Uh, and I said, well, there's only one thing you can do with this ship. She can't be a passenger vessel. And if you just want her as a floating billboard, you could get a billboard on the highway for $3,000 a month. Um, it should be a sailing school vessel. So by after several years of, well, actually, my former boss joked and said, when we became Coast Guard inspected, he said, congratulations on winning the seven years war. I didn't feel so confrontational with the Coast Guard. I mean, I understand their purpose. So by the early 90s, she was a school ship. And as a school ship, we did a variety of programs. Um, we still did, you know, port visits were a huge income stream. But but we did educational programs for all ages, sometimes for kids, sometimes college programs, sometimes general admission for adults. Uh, when we took her to Europe in 96, it was a a, a 22 month season, I think, of uh, wow. of general admission programs. In '96, we took her to Brest. There's a because mm-hmm. every four years there's a traditional sailing event there, so we took her to Brest. And the French photographer Philippe Plisson kind of fell in love with the ship. Maybe partly because my I had a French speaking crew member who was very young and beautiful. Um, <laughs> in any case, he began to take many pictures of us. So. In, 2000, skip ahead to 2000, Peter Weir went to that festival and he was looking at ships. He was looking at ships for the film and he saw all the, you know, Square Cell Limited ships from Charlestown in England. He saw whatever there was on offer and he said, nah, that's not really what I want. But the, the, the poster for the event by Plisson featured a picture of my ship. So, uh, Weir said, I want to find that ship. Where is that ship? So he came back to the U.S. and contacted what was then the American Sail Training Association. It's now called Tall Ships America. Yeah. He contacted them and they went, oh, that's Rose. She's up in Halifax. So he called my office and uh, we were in Halifax on a, a season of Canadian Maritimes. And uh, he flew up to Halifax and spent 
three days with me and uh, we took him aloft. We took him below. We took him everywhere. We talked history. I broke out lots of books for him to look at. At one point, uh, he was telling me about movies he'd made. And I was like, yeah, I've heard of that one. No, I haven't heard of that one. I, heard of <laughs> I remember being at some place having a beer with him and he wrote, I wish I had it still. He wrote on a bar napkin, I think, a list of all his movies. And uh, I'd love to have kept it, but somehow I didn't. But anyway, <laughs> he went back to Hollywood or wherever and said, uh, buy it. I want this ship. So my office, you know, it was a small nonprofit, family owned. This was a very, this was not a great, great business venture. No. I think by the end we were paying our way, but still it was marginal. Yes. So Hollywood calls and I negotiate to buy the ship and they say to my my office people, they go, well, but there's only one condition. Peter wants to be sure that he can get the captain to go with it. And uh, so my office calls and tells me this and they go, you'll go, won't you? And I was like, wait a minute, you're going to sell me with the ship? <laughs> uh, the matter was, I'm pretty sure that thing it was what kind of thing was frowned on after the late 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of the matter is that Hollywood paid a lot better than nonprofit mm, education. Okay, okay. So uh, I went, and the other sidebar, which is possibly of minimal interest, is that by this time with the nonprofit, I had been deferring my full paycheck for over a 10 year period. So they owed me a quarter of a million dollars. And my friends were like, you're never going to get that money. And I was like, no, no, I think I will. Two reasons. <laughs> One, I trust these people. Yeah. And two, which is maybe naive, but a claim for Siemens wages trumps everybody in court, the IRS, yeah. the market, anybody. Yeah. So I'm not worried about it. But in any yeah. case, they deferred the payments over a two-year period. So I came away from it. You know, in pretty good shape. I mean, I'd earned the money, but it was yeah. like a savings plan that I never would have done on my own. So, uh, so that's how Peter Weir acquired the ship. Nice. In nice. short, O'Brien's books. Were you familiar with them at the time? Well, you know, I forget exactly when, but possibly as late as ninety-ish or ninety-one. My friend, who was the director, a fellow named Peter Neal, who was the director of. South Street Seaport Museum said to me, Bailey, you got to read these books with what you do. You have to read these books. And I was like, eh, Peter, I don't know. I'm living it. I don't need to read those books. Yeah. So, uh, but I did read one and then I read them all. And pretty soon I realized that it would be a really good idea to hitch my wagon to the Patrick O'Brien star. Yeah. And one, I used to work in the off season. I would be working late in the office and one night, well, I ended up taking an ad. I got a free. I traded Norton the use of the ship for a reception in 1995 at in New York City, like a reception for 245 industry op opinion leaders in mm -hmm. the public world. And many people came, uh, semi-celebrities, Dominic Dunn, John Dunn, Jane Didion, uh William F. Buckley, Walter Cronkite. Walter had a, had a bit of a relationship with the Rose already, but um, but so we did that. And then for the, for this, I got a little ads in the Patrick O'Brien newsletter. So one night, I'm sitting in my office at nine o'clock at night, and a fellow calls and he's asking me about sailing on the ship, and it was Dean King, and Ooh, yeah. so that further enlarged our our hitch to the wagon. Yeah. Um, but. Um, you know, O'Brien came to that reception. It's funny because uh, Nikolai Tolstoy writes in his volume two of his O'Brien biography that Mrs. Mrs. O'Brien was too ill to attend. So I I have, perhaps you've seen them, posted pictures of Mr. and Mrs. O'Brien aboard the ship at the <laughs> Seaport Museum in 1995. And she was indeed there. So I'm sorry I didn't catch that for Mr. Tolstoy before he published it. But <laughs> it's not too you know, I follow the 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 that Facebook page, the Patrick O'Brien Appreciation Society, and I, I'm not. I mean, people are talking about I'm on my third circumnavigation of the books, and I, I haven't done that. I, I've read them all once, and I think about reading them again, but hmm. but I haven't. Richard, there's a there's a lot of folklore on the internet and I've, I've gotten the book, the <clears throat> story about you and O'Brien having a conversation about the Rose looking like the surprise. And I was wondering if you could tell your story. about Oh your conversation. yeah. 
another person who I won't I won't name here said, oh, well, Richard and O'Brien had a conversation about painting the rose with a Nelson checker, and, and O'Brien suggested it, and Richard immediately went out and directed it to be done. That's not really true. We did okay. talk about it. He said, I think his quote is, have you ever considered the Nelson checker? And I said, well, I have considered it, but this is a replica of a 1757 ship, so mm-hmm. she painted it in those colors. But the more I considered hitching my wagon to the Patrick O'Brien star, I realized the visual power of painter, painting her in the Nelson checker. And so about, about a year later, we, we painted her up so she had the black gun ports and the yeah. wider black strake, but still the ochre, the ochre stripe. Yeah. So it was not quite so immediate, but, it, but we did do it at, somewhat at O'Brien's suggestion. And certainly, as I say, because we realized the, uh, the marketing value of it. Okay. And would that have been her color scheme when uh, Peter Weir encountered her in uh, in Brest? Yeah. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. <clears throat> and what a what a great place to encounter her. <laughs> yeah. Another event in Halifax. It might have been that year. I was at a reception with you know of captains at the Lieutenant Governor's house, and one captain came up to me and said, "Jesus Christ, how much money do you spend on gunpowder in a year?" Because we always would arrive firing guns. Yeah. And I happened there happened to be a picture uh, a copy of the local paper on the table next to us with a picture of my ship, page one above the fold, firing guns. So I just reached down and picked up the paper and I said, well, you know, I might spend two or three hundred bucks a year on gunpowder, but look at this. I don't spend a dime on advertising. (laughs) Very good. Money well spent. (laughs) You never thought Jack might be in it for the marketing. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd love to get into what this might have been like as, as, as a proposition for everybody, because Richard, clearly moving from one ocean to another aboard the ship was 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 no big deal. You, you crossed the Atlantic before. But I'm looking in the foreword from Tom Rothman, the executive producer, who's going, we really weren't sure how this was going to turn out. The closing line of the blurb says, hopefully they'd make it in one piece. It, it seems like then the production team had set their hearts on getting the rose not only in one piece, but on time there to become the floating equivalent of HMS surprise. Um, what was your thinking on what needed to be done to get the ship from Connecticut, from Eastern Seaboard, round to California? Well, you know, from the Panama Canal to San Diego is about 3,500 miles, which is a longer trip than going to Europe. Mm. And sadly, the prevailing winds are northwesterlies, which is exactly the course. Yeah. So I had, I had said to Hollywood, you know, with these engines that we've got, they were barely added up to 300 horsepower twin GM 671s. I said, there's no way we can motor up that coast if the winds are as the as the predictions suggest they'll be. So, and they said, well, what do you propose? And I said, well, we'll have to tack out, you know, some, some hundreds of miles and tack back in. And they were like, how long will that take? And I was like, I don't know. It could be, it could be as much as 30 or 40 days. And they were like, find out how much it would cost to put it on a heavy lift ship. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I priced that out. It was $950,000. And they were like, well, what would it cost to put new engines in it? And I was like, well, I, I don't know. We could get an estimate. So we ended up repowering the ship with big caterpillars. And this, this, this doubled our horsepower. So in the preparations to sail, we got these engines installed. Yeah. And, uh, the Formist, which was a steel tube, uh, 22 inches in diameter and half-inch wall pipe, uh, and the mainmast and the mizzenmast too, um, was had always been a little bit animated in its mass step. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, or it's not its step, but its wedges in the foredeck. So we really super strengthened the, the timbers beneath the deck uh, so that the mast wouldn't shift so much. Yeah. And then with this newly powered ship, we set off. And uh, a sidebar issue is this trip was the worst weather Rose was ever in, including oh, wow. including an April passage to Europe in yeah. 96. So, um, and any number of other storms. But the issue was um, before we left, we engaged a weather router and, uh, you know, small private organization, one woman. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, no, you don't want to leave tomorrow. 
two lows are going to converge in the Gulf Stream just at the time you get there. And uh, I don't think you want to be in that. And so I took that to the Marine Department people who were in, in Newport. And I said, well, this is what the weather router says. And they were like, you'll get that f- ship out of here or we'll find somebody who will. And I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we set off. And just as the woman predicted, we two lows converged in the Gulf Stream. And we saw winds up into the 70s of knots. Wow. And we beat the crap out of the ship. But we had yeah. never done that before. Yeah. So there were... Um, corollary issues that did not appear until months later but um but there were many that were immediate that required a lot of attention that will discuss this in his work yeah without too many spoilers i entertained you and some of the rest of the maintenance crew a lot for the rest of the passage right will yeah um i think uh I stayed busy. That was, that was for sure. <laughs> I had a, I had a, I had a large work list the whole time, but it was, um, we're getting the rose was very different for me because coming from Iris, I had studied the, the perfection of wooden boat building, uh, perfect dovetail joints and uh, ideal conditions and materials. And mm. on the rose, we were flying by the seat of our pants and, and it was a wonderful new skill set that I developed. I, uh, you know, my chisels were replaced with a chainsaw and, (laughs) and the, the, the plan was to get the work as done as fast as possible. And I have to say my work on the rows really improved my efficiency, uh, just across the board with everything I approached after that. Um, cause even if it wasn't repairing or doing work on the ship, I mean, if I took my time getting up to breakfast, well, I might've missed bacon or, uh, so yeah. That changes your attitude to the whole day right there. <laughs> it really did. It helped me learn how to prioritize my time much better. This this not a moment to lose. It's a real thing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Will, you write in the book about the world of planet tall ship. Planet tall ship people, rebels. Can you paint a picture for us uh, of the planet tall shipper and what kind of people they were? Yeah. Um, you know, I uh I was very excited to be a yachty out of Iris and working on these nice polished classic yachts. And we made a lot more money than the tall ship crew uh, did. And I, and I'm going to, I'm going to go right to the economics of this. And we had clean polos and khakis and everything was nice and clean. And you have nice yacht dinners afterwards with the owners and drink Heineken's or Mount Gay and tonics. But on the rows, or, or I'll just say sort of the, tall ship community, there's a lot of volunteerism. And because the the boats are all nonprofits, there's not, the pay is very low and the work is also very dirty. There's a lot of tar involved and there's, uh, you don't have the amenities that you might have on a yacht. So you'd have, I, I kind of feel that planet tall shippers, it was sort of my way of categorizing this group of sailors that and the book I call them, refer to them also as the hell's angels of the sailing world where you have these people who loved and adopted this lifestyle through and through, or even some people would buy this soap that smelled like tar because they <laughs> loved, they fell in love with the smell of tar from tarring the rig. And I just couldn't understand that or subscribe to it whatsoever. I consider myself sort of to, to make it easier for the reader than I, you've got the rebels, which I'll say is sort of my category of, of crew members on the ship who were happy to be there, but we were absolutely going to refuse and subscribe to this. Uh, the individual who loved being covered in tar and Marlin and the old way things were done and singing sea <laughs> shanties. Um, I appreciated what the rose was, but I was not going to, to drink that Kool-Aid. Okay. Okay. Well, let's 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 balance the conversation up a little bit. R- Richard, t- tell us about it from from the perspective of somebody who's in the in the Hell's Angels. They're the tall shippers. What, <laughs> what, what, what about these young rebels coming aboard with their khakis and their clean hands? How how did they seem to you? Was it was this a necessary inconvenience, or was this a chance to bring them into the fold? Well, they were definitely going to ruin a lot of clothes in a hurry. Um, I can't embrace uh, Will's lexicon, but in our field, in traditional sail, we call it working sail. And uh, there's a certain amount of denigration of yachties and their and their effete habits. We don't use lavender soap. 
Um, <laughs> really? Really? I, there's a, there's I, a part I, of the world I, where people still don't use lavender soap? My God. It, I think it was in the uh, articles of war at one point. <laughs> Pine tar soap is actually kind of wonderful stuff. I think I have a dozen bars of it in the house right now. <laughs> Love uh, it. But as I say, in, in the world of working sale, we I think culturally we think of ourselves as being in a long line of maybe six or 10,000 years of seafaring. Mm. And uh, we study old ways and uh, figure, you know, if they worked for some hundreds or thousands of years, that must be a reason. Right. You know, there's always a need for new blood, though. So uh, <laughs> you want you want some experienced working sale people in a ship, yeah. but you can always train a new batch of volunteers or or newbies or whatever to call them. Right. Um, I personally don't thrive on being covered in pine tar, but I I, <laughs> I have a jar of it here in the house. To, is okay. It, it really like. <laughs> Just for a little a little sniff, a little reminder. That's oh, great. Man, yeah. No. I've got to say, for, from reading the book, if pine tar was the only thing you ever smelled, then I think you'd been doing okay. Mm. But, <laughs> but anyhow, so I, I'm really interested in this. I'm thinking about this from the perspective of a, of a story to be told, right? We've got Jeopardy. We've got Will right. the Rose make it through this unaccustomed, um, un, you might even say unseasonal, unplanned, encountered with wind and waves and managed to get through the, the those challenges without getting completely unsustainable levels of damage. And we've got the two, I'm not going to call them rival gangs. I'm going to say these these two parallel clans of individuals making up the ship's company the jeopardy here, it sounds like, will, will they make it to the end as a cohesive crew? I mean, this we've, we, we've got ships and sea and people in a lab, but this sounds like a setup already for a Patrick O'Brien book, so this is good. Right. Without too many spoilers, tell us about some of the kind of things that this crew and this ship encountered along the way to test them. Well, I think uh, probably the most pressing encounter was, you know, we're, I think, four days out when we encountered that converging of the lows that Richard talked about. And because of the the press of the schedule, there wasn't much time to train the crew and sufficiently, I'd say, get us all acclimated with setting the sails and, and operating the ship. Now, to preface, there was a good percentage of the crew, at least half that were solid tall ship sailors, working sailors, who really had a great understanding, a lot of experience on rows. And in addition to that, the the officers and all these sailors were very adept and experienced with training volunteers and sail trainees. So for someone like myself, where I had great sailing qualifications on a yacht, sailing a ship like Rose was, it was like Greek to me, nothing, not much applied. But um, I think that all that time in the yard preparing Rose was kind of a little bit like in the first karate kid where Daniel's son's got to wax Mr. Miyagi's cars, but then what he doesn't realize is that he's learning how to do what he's expecting to be taught. So I think our work in the yard had through the direction of the officers right. had helped us learn how to work together and understand our roles and how to communicate. So even though I didn't really have, I didn't have any experience when we got out there in that, in that challenging weather, we had a, a great understanding of how to cooperate and work together. And I, th I think, I think in those tense moments, we had that. And then later on in the Caribbean sea, we dismasted under full sail. And that was <laughs> quite an experience, quite, quite a harrowing experience. That's why on the, the cover of the book, you see this odd looking mm. rig that we dubbed the wrecking team. <laughs> I think you had a t-shirt made of that picture as well, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but through it all, I can say that, I mean, yeah. no one was hurt. No one died. And uh, I always felt confident and safe yeah. through the, with the leadership uh, that was given uh, by the officers, Captain Bailey and our able bodies. And only one guy dropped out. In the book, there's this really vivid picture of how sailing a tall ship you know, will is a 3D proposition. You know, we've got, you know, port and starboard, fore and aft, but you also have up and down. Right. And this is this is I'm amazed some of our listeners who have gone off and, you know, embraced this tall ship life here, too. So tell us a little bit. I mean, you talk in the book about laying out along the yard. You know, how does that feel for somebody who's done all their sailing kind of at sea level? Well, that was um, when I was 
reluctant about accepting the job. I, I couldn't make up my mind in Newport. I was an indecisive 21 year old. Casey got angry at me one night and said, that, well, this is just silly that you haven't figured this out. Why don't you go down and tell Tony you want to go lay in a yard? And I didn't know what it meant. And I asked him, he said, just go. So go down and Tony's eating dinner. And I say, Hey, you know, Casey's asked, he's told me to tell you, I want to go lay in a yard. And Tony stops eating and says, okay, well let's go do it. And now it's at nighttime and I don't know what we're doing, but we walk up onto deck and he puts on a, a safety belt and gives one to me and says, okay, let's climb the rig. And yeah, up until that point, I mean, I've gone aloft in bosun's chairs on yachts, but the notion of free climbing your rig was not something I had, you know, I, I was unfamiliar with, but climbing up and laying out on the yard is a term applied to where you step off of the rig and you step onto the foot rope of the yard and your weight is you're, you're out on the yard. And that experience was really having that new perspective where this is where you're supposed to be on a ship like this and looking at the horizon, what's around you looking down mm. at the deck was, was really thrilling. And especially when we were underway and cause there at the dock, the boat's just sitting still and it's moving a little bit, but once you're underway, I mean, there's a lot of, there's pitching and rolling and uh, you're feeling a greater power of wind from aloft. Yeah. And yeah, that whole sort of three dimensional aspect of sailing where every, everything else had just been done from deck for me. And it's a different kind of experience. <laughs> and, and a different kind of sailing for sure this sounds like it's one of the defining parts of the experience is that something you get from lots of people who come on uh, tall ship experiences richard yeah i wanted to interject there's an interesting euphemism uh for first timers i'm not saying this happened to will but for first timers going aloft and laying out in the yard their legs are splayed on the foot rope and sometimes a leg or two will start to really twitch and uh in the industry, we call this sewing machine leg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, I, I've heard uh, mountain climbers talk about that as Elvis leg. <laughs> <laughs> did that happen to you? Uh, it did not happen to me. <laughs> Good. Uh, it, it, it's funny. It seems like it's one of the defining moments of, are you, are you going to get this? Are you cut out for it? And do you want it enough? Um, it, th that episode in the book will remind me a lot of one of the early chapters of the, the Grain Race book by Eric Newby, uh, when he he goes in his smart city um, advertising man's suit to say, can I sign on with this ship? And the bosun or the second mate or whatever it is just looks at him and goes up the rigging and like, never mind what you're wearing. If you can show that you can get up there and look like you can function and succeed up there, then everything else will fall into place. And he got tar on his trousers, but he came down and that was the beginning of that story. That's a, that's a great book. That's one of my favorite reads. Yeah. So that brings us on to the topic of the wear and tear. And I'm thinking about this from the perspective of somebody who might kind of sign on to do a tall ship experience. There's, there's a lot in the book about the work that the crew has to do just to keep the ship in good working order, d despite the action of the, the, the wind and the weather. What's the experience like for somebody who goes on a sailing experience with, on a tall ship these days? Are they going to get to spend time bracing yards and filling topsails? Are they going to be spending time tarring and scraping or also telling stories and drinking rum? What's that What's that experience like, Richard? Well, we don't drink underway, okay. uh, which can be painful because before we sailed for Europe, it's a, it's a long story, but before we sailed for Europe, we had 10,080 bottles of Samuel Adams beer delivered to the ship and the crew the crew was quite heartbroken when they realized that they weren't going to be drinking any until we got to <laughs> You're going to have to look at it for three and a half thousand miles. Right. <laughs> but, um, in terms of work, I mean, if people are signing on for a week of sail training, we don't usually set them to doing shipboard maintenance. But uh, if you're a crew member, you can expect it. Um yeah. Every day there's something. I mean, yeah. we don't just make up the work list. We have them banked and ready for when we have bodies available to do the work. Um, but like anything, there's a huge amount of maintenance to take care of a ship underway. Yeah. And on this particular trip, there was so much repair work to do that uh, there weren't idle times for anyone. Wow. 
And I guess when you got to California with the rose, there must have been the, the, the cosmetic make it look like the surprise refit, but also some other bits of refit. How, how long was the ship being fettled? Well, you know, when we got to Hollywood, after all this panic about the schedule, when we got to Hollywood, some of the bigwigs came down to the dock and said, well, you're 30 days early. What are we supposed to do with it now? So I was like, hey, you put the gun to my head. I got it here as quickly as I could. Um, there were so I forget exactly. We got there in February, and sh- I don't think shooting began until June or July. So we had all of that time. She was hauled out again, and uh, there was tons of work done. Just all the cosmetic stuff. They peeled up. Have you been to Greenwich to see the transom of HMS Indefatigable up on the wall? Yes, I have. And it's like a giant butterfly pinned to the yeah. bulkhead. Well, the entire transom was taken off rows and replaced. Now, the transom that came off was two inch thick hardwood with Lexan windows that, that were certified by the ABS, uh, American Bureau of Shipping, as storm proof. The, the transom that went back, back on was household house lumber two by sixes with house glass glazed windows so just for starters i mean it was very beautiful it had more camber more roundness than the original rose transom and it's very elegant and beautiful but it can't go to sea it could never pass any kind of inspection so when i say millions of dollars to get the ship back to sea that's just one of the many things that would need to be Mm. done but there were months to work on her between arrival and and filming. Well, I I think it leads naturally into this question about, you know, we read that the Rose is perpetually under repair as she floats alongside in San Diego. So do you you think she's ever going to be able to sail and be filmed again? Or, you know, is is there an alternate subtitle? I I think she can sail for filming, and she has. I mean, they can take her out in the harbor and sail her for an ad or – Pirates of the Caribbean or whatever. I mean, they could take her out and do something with her, but she's not going to be making any ocean voyages. And for a while, the Coast Guard in the port of San Diego had a, a not a stop work order, but a stop, you know, you're confined to the port order. Mm. I don't know where that stands now, but I know among the tasks that they've undertaken, the weather deck in Rose, which was, you know, was put on in 1969, so it was getting on in years. Um, it was three-inch thick quarter sawn Douglas fir, a near virgin timber, you know, with 30 growth rings per inch. Um, But it began to rot away, and I guess it was leaking, so they decided to replace the deck. So the current deck is, I believe, a sandwich of plywood, uh, interior planking to look good from underneath, and then one or two-inch deck planking on top of that. this is not a good solution for the torquing that, you know, that those masts in the deck are held by the deck partly uh, and by the timbers. So I think that if she went out and took the battering that we took with the deck that's on her now, there would be real repercussions. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know what else has been done to her, but uh, I mean, they put planks in the bottom. There was a dramatic video in the fall of her, losing control of her engines the engines were there she was backing into the dry dock and something went wrong and they Sweet. smashed into a concrete pier that took out a quarter gallery and part of the starboard aft quarter but uh that seems to be repaired and yeah. reasonably nicely done uh so i mean i think she's probably a good museum uh exhibit and yeah. uh, you know I think enthusiasm for master and commander outside of our narrowly confined circles is probably diminishing because oftentimes when people ask me about what my career has been, my shorthand will be, well, have you seen the film master and commander? And uh, now as I ask that question, more and more people are go blank and like, no, no, never heard of it. So I think the enthusiasm commander is fading a little in the general population yeah. And that may affect gate admissions of people who want to see the ship at a museum. But I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah, Time indeed. I mean, it's it, funny. There's this perennial debate among the, the fandom online about, you know, whenever are they going to make a, a new uh, version of the movie or a TV series? And we all kind of realize that if you made it just for the people who know and love the books, that's a handful of tens of thousands of people worldwide. And you yeah. need millions of people to go see the movies. Exactly. You've both 
I guess, have read the O'Brien books. Richard, you've met Patrick O'Brien. What do you think he would have been like as a shipmate? I don't think Mr. O'Brien had the breadth of experience that his novels suggest. Yeah. Um, he could be pretty prickly, I gather. Um, yeah. <laughs> he, he seemed to be... Either he was super sarcastic or he was just kind of unaware. But as we walked the gun deck aboard Rose and I was showing him around, you know, keep in mind that my driver's license says that I'm five foot two. I may have shrunk a little since then, but <laughs> but O'Brien, who was maybe five foot eight, says to me, oh, well, you know, Nelson was he was very short. He was pitifully short. And I was like. Well, geez, that's an interesting way. Yeah. Uh, you too, well, mate. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I don't know if he was very socially aware. Um, no kidding. He did have a right. Yeah. <laughs> have you watched that BBC Patrick O'Brien Nothing Personal thing? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you can see how prickly he is there. I think that. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, very cautious about people and inquiry and privacy. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty, probably pretty indicative of his general personality. So I don't know if I, he would have been a good. I think he would have been in awe of the tall ship experience, and we did indeed try to get him aboard to sail. But you know, they were in fragile health by the mid nineties, getting aboard. yeah, yeah. So uh, it didn't happen. But it would have been fun to have taken him for a day sail. But I mm -hmm. don't think he would have fit fared well with the rigors of of tall ship sailings it sounds like not but what do you think will any thoughts well i'm going to give you a little uh not a spoiler but how about a little easter egg from the book which is nice there's i've, I've got the chapter where we talk about patrick o'brien's real name which is richard russ right. and when i was reaching out to all my shipmates for the book you know not everyone could be found um it was i i was able to reach a lot of them but not everyone. And so for the, uh, for the crew members who I couldn't find or, or speak with, I, I changed their names out of respect for the book. And there's these two characters. Um, one's name is Rich and the other one's name is Russ. And so they get introduced as Rich and Russ. I didn't spot that. And their personalities are sort of what I think about. They, they both lacked, uh, they had no sailing, no boating experience, but they had a, a great intellectual capacity. I think they were interesting. They were, I'm glad that they were on the ship, but I guess I kind of gave them those names because I kind of thought they might have been a little bit like what Patrick would have been like on the ship. <laughs> oh, I'm going to read again with that in mind. I, I didn't spot that. Nice job. Nice job. <laughs> oh, I love that Easter egg. <laughs> Well, in, in the book, there was a fair amount of sort of jockeying for position between the two of you, enabled by some excellent pranks. So 2023, is is the score even? Or Captain Bailey, you're still waiting for the moment to get a little revenge uh, prank on Deckhand Will? I hadn't <laughs> thought of it, but you might inspire me. Um, <laughs> okay, you know, what have we done? <laughs> the, the fish was quite remarkable. A, a lot of effort went into it. And uh, my first thought was, it's a prank. And, the, you know, somebody else once had put a five-pound tin of tuna on my line, which was, <laughs> was funny, but pretty not convincing. So Will's fish was, at first glance, pretty convincing. And then after a second or two, I was like, hey, this is a prank. And then as I began to pull it in, I was like, holy shit. This thing is real. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, it went back and forth. But uh, whether or not, I mean, I do love a good prank, and I've certainly been known to do some. So who can say? I mean, nice. We ever, <clears throat> uh, we ever, we don't ever tire of a good prank. I think I was on the, sh I think it was on the ship for maybe, it was my first two weeks, and we were in Newport. And you guys know about Thomas the Train. There's, right. you know, oh, yeah. there's, I think like a Theodore, the tugboat. And so there's a real life Thomas, the train. And well, there's a real life Theodore tugboat and the tugboats in the Harbor and Richard, <laughs> Captain Bailey comes to me and says, you know, it'd be really funny if there was an eye patch and a mustache on the tugboat in the morning <laughs> and sort of Richard helped task me with playing a prank on this other nice. ship. And I would say, you know, from day one, as much as we did have sort of the rebelling groups, uh, pranks were a really important mechanism uh, and well-received on the ship. Uh, so. 
Well, I, I think if anybody's listening to this and wants to know more about what was the origin of the fish thing, I think you need to read the book. I think you need to read the book. Right. There's, right. there's, there's a great strand of the narrative there all about this. Excellent. Since we're talking about experiences aboard tall ships, if there's anybody listening today who's thinking, I'd like to get that experience, I'd like to learn, I'd like to volunteer in in the US or even elsewhere around the world, where are some places where people might start looking? I think there are two basic resources to begin. In the US, there's an organization called Tall Ships America. They have a web presence and they maintain a directory of every sail training program in the United States. Mm. And then in Europe, there is Sail Training International, of which yeah. most sail training ships are members. And that's the best gateway, I think. Another fabulous ship to sail on. Her captain is my vintage, I think, at least. So I don't know what his plans are for the future, but he's Europa. She's a bark. Yeah. She does fabulous ocean voyaging, often to Antarctica. And beyond, well, I don't know if it's really beyond to Antarctica, but right, pretty. She sails pretty extensively, so there are wow. so many opportunities. I would say, yeah, fantastic. I am uh, certainly well past retirement age. However, this summer I'll take a barkentine called Gazella Primero out for a few weeks, Ooh. based in Philadelphia, as largely a museum ship. But there's a volunteer corps that maintains her, and uh, they've booked some port visits for this summer. So I'm going to go down and do that for a few weeks. You know, Will, I, I know you're in the midst of uh, an exciting round of promotion and speaking engagements. You know, where are people, where could they catch you in the coming weeks and months? Well, yeah, I have got uh, a very aggressive book tour booked. We've got about right. 50 speaking events in the next six months. And what, what really helps me out with this tour is three of us had video cameras while we were uh, for the oh. journey. And I've been able to pull all that footage and a lot of photographs. So I've got uh, a lot of compelling footage of sailing through the storm, the, the dismasting, and I've put together this really sharp and curated presentation that I live narrate. And um, right now I'm speaking at a, a number of museums around the country. I was just uh, invited to speak over in London at the Royal Thames Yacht Club and also um, one of the museums over in England, the one that's got victory. I'm speaking at yacht clubs and uh, really also trying to get out to schools. I think um, for me, a big part of this book is that learning through doing is is paramount. I think that Tall Ships experience really uh, support that type of learning. And there's fundamentals beyond tarring rigs that we all take away from sailing a ship like Rose that I, that I still apply in life every day. Um, so if anyone's curious, I mean, I think the easiest way to, to find me is you can go to my website, which is www.willsoffern.com. And uh, I've got a contact form there. And if anyone has any inquiries, you can sh shoot me an inquiry and I'll, I'll let you know where I am or where I think I'm going to be. Excellent. Well, th thank you very much. Will, first of all, tons of good luck with the book. It, it's a great read. We hope that you get great engagement with the audiences. And you, I like this idea of reaching out for education as well. Um, right. And I hope that the next generation of rebels and tall shippers are coming. Thank you to you, Richard, for joining us. Really, really great to hear the stories. Thank you for collaborating with The Lover's Hole on this interview. We've really, really enjoyed having you with us. Um, Ian and Mike, I want to say thank you and big fan of you guys doing this podcast. I've really enjoyed listening to. I mean, you guys are putting a lot out there and I really enjoy it. And uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, you're very kind. Thank you. Well, that was fun. It was great to hear from Will about the human side of his experience as a tall ship sailor. Yeah, the, in the uh, his own version of the Patrick O'Brien Behaviour Lab. Great to hear as well from Captain Bailey, one of the great characters of the historical sailing world. And as we were hearing there, someone who had a front row seat for some of the encounters between Patrick O'Brien and his adoring public back in the late 90s and early noughties. Yeah, this, this may be somebody we have to return to again. Yeah. Hear some more about that. I sure would love that. Definitely. In the meantime, you know, we left Jack and Stephen ashore in Ireland with lots of questions still to be resolved. You know, are Stephen's legal worries now over? Are mm -hmm. Diana and Stephen at one again? Right. Is Sophie going to receive Jack with open arms? And Mike, we're wondering, what about Clarissa and Padine and Bridget? Yeah, come to think of it, what about Christine Woods? Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, Mike, we've got a wonder here. Is the Yellow Admiral going to give us all the answers or are we going to be off on another story arc altogether? This is Patrick O'Brien. You can never tell. No, I'd say there's just one way to find out. Ian, what do you say next week to pulling the Yellow Admiral off the shelf and having just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Mike, I should like that of all things. Oh,